Hi, I'm Joe Walensky, and I am the principal of Walensky & Associates, and we have an event coming up in Raleigh, North Carolina that's going to be October 4th and 5th, uh, and that's being held uh, in, the co in cooperation with the Department of English at North Carolina State, so we're excited about that. Um, I've gotten a chance to talk with many of our speakers, and so today I'm speaking with one of my colleagues, a uh, longtime uh, friend in the tech comm space, Scott Deloach. Hi, Scott. How are you doing today? I'm very good. How are you, Jeff? Yeah, it's all going well. I'm speaking from uh, downtown Seattle. Where are you at today? Miami Beach. Miami Beach. That's your hometown. That's right. All right. Well, uh, yeah, I know all about the things you're involved in, but for the people that may not be familiar, uh, why don't you uh, just give a little bit about your, uh, you know, your background types of things that you're involved in? I'm sure. So I run a company, Clickstart, do mostly uh, player consulting and training, uh, sometimes HTML uh, consulting and training or CSS, embedded user assistance. But uh, that's how I usually spend my time, um, HTML, CSS, anything to do with the web. Uh, I've been doing that, as you know, for quite a while and have some cool things to share at the conference, uh, touching on new things in both of those technologies. Well, you've been doing this for a long time, so before we uh, get into the sessions, um, what's, uh, what's like different now? I think, to me, the most exciting thing, I'll touch on it in my uh, CSS session, I'm really excited about changes in cascading style sheets, how much smarter they're getting, because uh, in the past, it's been kind of a mix. Maybe the cool stuff's been in JavaScript, and the easy stuff's been in CSS, and now that line's really blurring. So to me, that's the most exciting thing, um, kind of not having to do the hard stuff in JavaScript but being able to do it in CSS, and it's also making it easier for people, too. Well, we might as well talk about that session, which is uh, cascading style sheets, CSS best, best practices. So. Um, what types of things do you talk about in that? Uh, to me, the coolest thing with CSS that's new is uh, CSS variables. And um, a classic example would be, uh, let's say you just need to use a corporate color. It's very common, and you want to use it in lots of different places. In the past, you had to say, hey, use the color over and over and over. And then if it changed, you had to change it in every spot. I mean, it's just so inefficient. Now you can make that a variable, and when you want to use the color, you just reference a variable and then if you change it you just change it in one spot like it should be and they all change so customization is going to be easier setup's going to be easier and that's just one small thing that's new in css that makes it so much better to use yeah, and you can immediately think of uh, in, in, in uh, documentation all the places that uh, variables like that can be uh, valuable yeah, we're so used to single sourcing, so to us it's like, why hasn't that been in there? But I'm sure programmers too, but technology-wise, they intentionally limited it. Now they're saying, well, why do we put this limit on it? Let's, let's open it up. Why shouldn't it be more like a programming language? So, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. Well, you get to do, you get to do a lot of uh, a training um, with uh, authoring tools um, and so, uh, is, you know, as part of your training, what, how does... Like, how does CSS fit in with that? Like, what, what, what's your expectation of, of a, of a, of a uh, user assistance professional's uh, competency with uh, cascading style sheets? Uh, usually the people I'm teaching or working with, a lot of them just say, look, I don't want to have to deal with this. There's too many technologies. I want to focus on the writing, plus whatever I'm writing about, I have to be kind of an expert on that. I don't have time to be the CSS expert or the HTML expert. Um, so usually they want me to set it up and then teach them how to maintain it, which is kind of a different knowledge level than having to set it up yourself. And the setup might be an expert on something that only has to be done once. Um, for me, if I'm setting up for lots of different people, yeah, it is valuably an expert on that, but why do they need to know how to set up the variables? They just need to know what the variables are in this example and how to use them. So it's, I think it works out really well. And then, you know, people can always ask, like, hey, we need to have some new thing. How do I do it? So that's the biggest thing I'm seeing now. Maybe even with, say, a Flare project, I don't want to have to set it up if I'm only going to set it up one time. You set it up. 
and teach me how to maintain it and go forward. So I, I think that's been a shift in our uh, field as well. In the past, everybody tried to be maybe not expert in everything, but intermediate in everything. And now people are saying, hey, I don't have to do that. I can be an expert just in this part and maybe very basic in this part of my job. Yeah, and it works. And, well, like, how would you, like, from your experience in just seeing people at different uh, competency levels in uh, tech com, like, how, how does it break down in terms of people's aptitude and understanding of CSS? So, like, you're going to, like, if there was a zero, which is nothing, and a 10, which is, you know, full stack programmer, uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, experience with that. Um, and I, I, you know, I'd probably comfortably put myself somewhere in the, in the middle of that with, you know, feeling confident about understanding the structure, mm -hmm. but not necessarily always, uh, you know, remembering all the syntax and having to use documentation all the time. Uh, what do you think, uh, our colleagues are generally, how does that spread out? Uh, I think it breaks down in, in this separate tasks. I think if you looked at them across a wide range of say areas within the field, most people I think would be more of a three to a five, and, but they're comfortable with that. And maybe a few things, they might be a six or a seven. I don't think everyone's trying to be a 10 anymore because they realize it's just too much effort and I'm not getting enough out of it. I don't have to do this anymore, it's kind of liberating. If I need something that's at a 10 level, I'll hire someone and bring them in for a little bit of time and help me. Um, so I'd say most people are in the middle and they're just keeping track of different tasks or different technologies that they're well familiar with. Um, and a lot of things they admit, hey, I'm a one and I don't need to be past a one. I don't care. Mm -hmm. so that's kind of cool. Well, yeah, some of the projects I've been involved in, um, I haven't done the I haven't done the CSS coding for it, but I've, like I've seen some kind of amazing mm -hmm. transformations uh, and techniques and, and uh, things that are are really exciting. But but I guess like for me, like yeah, even in in my situation, maybe being that five, um, I'm not always able to like when I see it, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And I can kind of have an idea of how CSS might have rendered that. But I don't feel like I have the ability to envision like what mm -hmm. the possibilities are. So uh, I mean, what do you think about that? That's probably kind of a, a harder stretch to be able to yeah, I, those things. Yeah, CSS is such a design technology. I think in the past, what limited people was maybe their design skill. And now it's becoming really a design programming language. And what's going to limit people is their ability to program it, not just their ability to design something. So it's becoming more designer and programmer to really become a 10. And there aren't a lot of people that have those two skills that can do both of them at the same time. Um, yeah, you look at CSS style sheets right now, open it up and say notepad. And it looks like code almost. Mm -hmm. You can't look at it anymore and say, oh, yeah, I know what this is going to look like. Um, it's like looking at something from the Matrix now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, you're, the other topic, um, uh, and you, you're going to be involved in a lot of things uh, at the conference, including helping out with uh, a strategy workshop on authoring tools that we'll do. But uh, the other uh, topic that you're going to present is responsive content, single sourcing for desktop, mobile, and print. So what's that going to be all about? Um, the main focus of that presentation is just this idea of, even now, the concept of mobile first, that's been around for a while, but it's such a, a big idea on the web. Hey, design, say, for the smallest screen, and then progressively enhance it for a tablet, and then add any more features for a bigger screen. And yeah, that makes total sense when you're designing a website. But the challenge that we have as technical writers is we already have all this content. I can't, I'm not starting from nothing. I have thousands of pages that have already been designed probably for a piece of paper. How do you, how do you do the opposite? If you can't be mobile first, how do you <laughs> work that down to where it still works on a small screen? So it's completely opposite <laughs> approach, but we have to take that approach. 
So, you know, how do we do it? How do you go from a print design to something that will work and actually look good on a tablet and a phone and a desktop? So I have some solutions for that, technology and design solutions that I want to talk through. So, so getting back to kind of what, you know, where you see people being in our profession with respect to that, um, you know, I'm curious as to, you know, what you think about uh, the, you know, the competencies with responsive design um, and, uh, yeah, you, now responsive has been around for, for a long time. I don't think it's a, uh, it's a new concept to, uh, to many of us, but, uh, you know, I wonder if, you know, how much, whether, whether we're doing a good job with that as a group. I think as a group we are, I, and I think what's nice is now everybody pretty much knows the term and what it means and why it's important. So I'm not usually having to sell people on the idea of, hey, this needs to work on a tablet or a phone. Usually now people are saying that to me, and they understand that they need that. And they, they even have, I think most people have an understanding of what they can do it in maybe a limited way, but they don't know how to do it, and they, they're so overwhelmed. It's like, I don't have time to do this. I know why it's important. I know what we can do. Maybe you can fill in some gaps of some other things I didn't even know I can do. And I want you to do it <laughs> and just make it work. Um, so no one feels threatened like, well, if I don't do that, then you're doing my job. It's like you have so much, you have two people's job already. <laughs> keep trying to keep up with that and just let me help you. Um, so the competency is just the, the knowledge that it's out there and it can be done and about how much time it takes but not a competency of typically I can do this on my own. Uh, no, nope, they don't even want to figure it out. And I don't think that they should have to. We can't do everything anymore. I think tech writing, like when you and I started, uh, we did everything. You had to do everything and you were expected to do everything. And now it's sort of a, no, you do this part of the job and we're going to work as a team. And this person does this, this person does this. Even though we're both tech writers, we're doing different parts of the job. Well, um, how, how do you feel about the the idea or the thesis that if uh, if somebody's working with content where the responsive breakpoints are, uh, you know, recognizing that they're on uh, you know a small screen mobile device, that that maybe they're consuming information differently or maybe they're only interested in a small subset of the information. Um, you know, obviously that brings up a lot of complicated issues about the authoring process. Um, but I don't know, I'm always, I'm always struggling with that because I, 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 I guess the worst case is if something uh, goes into a small screen responsive breakpoint and it just, you know, then the, the amount of content is just so intensely dense that you don't feel like it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's the part that gets overlooked. And um, to me, that's the most interesting part and maybe the hardest part. I think that you're definitely on the cutting edge of that and you're kind of leading us in that direction with, with your book and other research that you've done. But responsive design in general just focuses really on the technology and the design part, just literally making it appear on the small screen and maybe making it look okay, but it doesn't think about the writing part. I usually intentionally make a distinction and call it like responsive design or responsive content or responsive writing because, yeah, the, it has to be written differently for the small screen. It's not just a matter of, hey, you can see it. You need different blocks of content written in a different way. It's the same equivalent we went through when we went from writing for paper to writing for the screen. It's that much different writing for a desktop and writing for a phone, but that's not getting a lot of attention yet. But I think it will. It's just slowly building up. So we'll have to see what happens, but I think quickly people are going to realize once most of the content's looked at on a phone, hey, yeah, it's there, but... I can't scroll. I don't want to scroll down 20 times to read this super long topic. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Well, uh, thanks for uh, taking this time to uh, chat with me about this and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you when we meet up in Raleigh. Great. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you.